Αξιότιμοι κύριο Μιλτή. Dear speakers, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of IOTC, I would like to welcome you to the debate. Peace cannot be enforced, it must be inspired. And I would like to thank you for uh, contributing to this uh, debate. I would like uh, to thank the Greek Olympic, the Hellenic Olympic Committee, the British Council for its support, and Intelligence Squared Greece, uh, thanks to which we organized this event. We have a lot of guests here today. Some might support that it is a utopia to talk about war and peace and how we can avoid or actually decrease conflicts. But we don't have only army and political uh, conflicts. We have uh, financial ones, or un but war requires social conflict, which we try to eliminate. Uh, that is why I believe the present debate is updated and I am very glad that we have all of you here because it uh, means that you have understand that we need to understand the importance of uh, peace. Continuous peace can be achieved only if it escapes the political and diplomatic elites and become part of our lives. When all of us choose to adopt the values of peace so as to make them our own business. At this point, I would like to present for the first time the video that uh, the IOTC has uh, prepared and which actually depicts in two minutes uh, the message of uh, truth. I believe that the message is conveyed, is rather clear. I would like to invite to the podium Mrs. Fanny Pali Petralia, IOTC Vice President and former Minister.
Say Sella. I would like to welcome my friend Lord Bates, Mr. Peter Economides, Mr. Platias, and Mrs. Maruza, journalist Mr. Andritsos, and all of you present here today in this interesting debate. I would like uh, to thank uh, the Mr. Kouvelos of the Hellenic uh, Olympic uh, Committee and, uh, of course, Mr. Phyllis. I would like to say that this debate intrigues us all from its uh, title. The ideal is peace to be inspired and inspire people. But in practice, practice has proven otherwise. Peace is and was or is not or was not something uh, that goes without saying. It is enforced after a lot of bloodshed. As Vice President of IOTC and uh, the center of, uh, of this center, I will just limit myself to talk about truth. Peace that uh, should prevail throughout the Olympic Games. Truce, as we know in uh, the antiquity, was enforced uh, from the moment the heralds, the, the heralds of uh, the games uh, were announcing the games the cities participating in the games were obliged to postpone wars. We know that in ancient Olympia there was a, a huge statue of truce which actually was placing a wreath on Iphitos who was uh, uh, the one who revived the ancient Olympic games. And before truce, uh, the people who did not follow truce were judged and convicted. The ones that fa were found guilty had to become servants or pay a fine, a huge fine. Nowadays, truce has taken huge dimensions. Uh, citizens are more sensitive in truth nowadays. I had the opportunity to observe that and experience that in the recent uh, games of 2012 uh, and this actually depicts uh, the wishes of all peoples of earth for uh, peace. The United Nations uh, actually invited all nations of the world to vote this resolution for truce. This uh, resolution is the first one in the history of the United Nations which is co-signed by 193 countries of the United Nations. 193 members of the United Nations. Unfortunately, some of these countries like Syria, for example, did not honor their signature in this framework uh, in during the uh, ancient times as, as uh, in ancient times now and in the future truce could be enforced uh, 
would it be possible to have a mechanism to enforce truce? These are questions that uh, need be touched upon during this debate. And uh, these are questions that have been discussed or raised in various fora in which I and a lot of you had the opportunity to attend either in the United States, the United Nations or in Europe where fora are organized linked to truce and peace. And here we have the idea that if someone can actually stop wars for 16 days, why shouldn't we that be a start to stop wars for longer? If all people in uh, the world are, excuse me, learn to be inspired by peace and learn by it, I believe that uh, any effort towards this direction, exchange of ideas uh, is important. And what we need to be aware of is that discussions like this one, or debates like this one today, some years ago, yes, Mr. Phyllis, they sounded uh, utopic. But uh, I assure you, since I have uh, a long experience within the Olympic family, I would like to tell you that things are not like that at all. After every debate, we all feel that we have taken a step forward towards yes or no. I am glad that I am amongst you today and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to invite Mr. Sfatos, member of the consulting uh, committee uh, of uh, advisory committee of IQ2. He told me that in November he will participate uh, in the marathon and uh, occasionally I think that we are running in a marathon trying to promote the ideals of uh, truce and peace via sports. As Mr. Sfatos, hopefully we will have a fruitful result. So you've got the floor, Mr. Sfatos. Thank you, Mr. Phyllis, uh, for the introduction. All of us uh, are in a marathon uh, in this country, right? Uh, uh, welcome to the first Intelligence Square Greece first debate for the period 2012-2013. Intelligence Square Greece is an organization, as you all know, organizes debates in this structure. You will experience today a I would like to thank, uh, first of all, the British Council supporter of this uh, event and an organization which has uh, always uh, supported uh, debates and uh, open uh, dialogues. I would like uh, to thank uh, the president uh, of uh, the committee for hosting us here. Uh, we organize this debate in cooperation with the IOTC. It is a great pleasure to cooperate with this uh, center, a center which has done a lot to promote cooperation, peace and truth throughout the world. Uh, 
cooperation, uh, this cooperation for us uh, signals uh, the beginning of a new period with uh, IAQ Square, with new actions via strategic alliances. The program of IQ Square will include uh, live uh, events and educational programs. Uh, this cooperation is indicative of how we with either agencies can pave the way uh, and touch upon uh, new topics and implement uh, new programs. Uh, as far as the educational program, uh, we will have uh, people uh, training uh, uh, in the art of debating, and we had about 130 students, 150 students must be inspired. This debate, of course, is carried out at a moment. We have a civil war in Syria. We have a lot of violence in Northern Africa, Middle East, Asia, and elsewhere. And possible conflicts um, are about uh, to become a reality. But the question uh, here is not limited uh, to uh, the present. A lot of uh, academians, philosophers have dealt uh, with that all these years. Uh, this is where I will rest uh, my case. I would like to thank uh, Sky TV, Athens Voice, uh, International Herald Tribune, uh, Apovrichion Magazine, uh, quintentially, and uh, the organizers uh, who are part of our organization. Uh, all these sponsors uh, are here always to support us. Thank you very much. So, without uh, uh, any delay, Mr. Andrichos, uh, uh, the moderator, is invited to the podium. I wish you all the best, Mr. Andrichos. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Well, I don't think I have uh, anything to add because uh, we have heard everything. A good debate demands a good procedure. And a good procedure, allow me to say, is a strict uh, procedure. Keeping the time, we can touch upon the essence uh, and then uh, we will give you the opportunity to uh, ask questions. Well, uh, we need to be flexible. There was a comment. Yes. Okay, we will be flexible but strict. As far as uh, the procedure is concerned, let's agree uh, upon that. From the beginning, the speakers will uh, actually uh, express themselves for the motion and against. The motion peace cannot be enforced, it must be inspired. You have seven minutes uh, each, then we announce the results of the voting, uh, the first voting, then we have uh, Q&A. You can ask uh, the speakers individually or as a team. And then we have a second uh, speech from uh, the speakers. And then we will have the final voting. Uh, the job of uh, the against uh, team is more difficult because they have a, a drawback. 65.6% is for the motion. Let's see if they will try to persuade you otherwise. As far as the Twitter is concerned, a lot of you are outside this uh, uh, room. Uh, IQ2 piece. Uh, uh, is something uh, that you can, uh, in which you can tweet your uh, comments. I believe uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are uh, in favor of truce. We have a lot of thousands of people killed since 2009. 2.5 million 
are actually in need of humanitarian aid. We have a lot of immigrants because of the war uh, in Turkey and adjacent countries. The international community, on the other hand, uh, tries to inspire uh, 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 peace, uh, all rights reserved, and there is a trend in the international community uh, to actually enforce uh, peace uh, with a lot of dangers. Uh, well, and uh, within this framework, we have another uh, question raised. Uh, is truth feasible with the interests uh, that uh, are uh, developed here. What uh, another question is Pax Americana, Pax um, European, uh, Europeana is feasible nowadays. So, and another question uh, has to do with Mr. Economides, uh, who is dealing with rebranding of uh, countries. After rebranding Greece, could we have rebranding peace? Is it uh, enough uh, to talk about peace the way we are talking right now, or we need to rebrand it? And I need uh, to disclose something else here. Let's see the differences between peace, truce, and ceasefire. Okay. That is for start. That is the end of my contribution here. I believe that journalists should not be the important part uh, of a speech. The news is you. We start with Lord Bates, uh, who has covered 4,600 kilometers in uh, 360 days. He walked from Olympia to London. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, Lord Bates, August, uh, was the most hostile month in Syria. It was a lethal month for Syria. What do you have to say about all these? You've got the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and good evening to you. And it's a great honor to be uh, here, and uh, I want to pay the warmest possible tribute, if I can, in beginning, to the work of the International Olympic Truth Center. Uh, sometimes, you know, things and organizations and people aren't quite appreciated in their own land, and uh, I can tell you that their work internationally is making a real difference around the world as they keep alive that vision and ideal. Uh, of the Olympic truce, and it's a great honor to be here uh, with them and to uh, be associated uh, with them, and I'm also particularly delighted uh, that the British Council uh, are uh, supporting this uh, excellent uh, event. Uh, now, um, this, uh, this particular motion, uh, all the pressure is on me because, of course, we're clearly out in front, uh, so the only way we can go is down, uh, but uh, I want to try and strengthen the resolve of the two-thirds in favor and make an appeal uh, to the third of doubters. And it focuses around the three words at the core of this motion. And the three words are peace, enforcement, and inspiration. Those three words are the key elements, I would argue, of this. And if we look at peace, first of all, what is peace? Uh, peace is more than just the absence of violence, I would contend. It is the presence of a system of justice. It is the presence of a system of education, of equality, of fairness, uh, a way in which we can resolve our grievances, a way in which we can make our own laws that we live uh, under. So peace is much more than the absence of violence. In terms of enforcement, if enforcement worked, then I suppose Afghanistan today would be a little bit like Switzerland, uh, given all the resource of the international community, uh, which has been uh, devoted into that troubled part of the world. But it isn't. And enforcement 
has a great difficulty. Long after the armies of Genghis Khan, of uh, Julius Caesar, of even Alexander the Great had disbanded, the ideas of Socrates, of Plato, of Aristotle continue to inspire us. Uh, long after tyrants such as Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot and Mao had slaughtered the masses, today we look to examples of the lives of Mahatma Gandhi, of Nelson Mandela, of Aung San Suu Kyi for our example as to how we should live. So therefore, though when there may be temporary setbacks, my argument is that ideals inspire us, and that element of inspiration is absolutely critical. Uh, our chairman mentioned uh, my walk. Uh, before I set off my walk, I gathered a group of friends together, and uh, I asked them what I thought they thought about my idea of walking 3,000 miles uh, from Olympia to London. And uh, after a little bit of consideration, they said, Michael, we can only think of three problems. Uh, the first one is, you've got the type of reputation that you get a taxi to go to the underground station, and that's only to go to Pizza Express. And therefore, we don't think you can make it, and therefore, uh, we suggest you don't even try it. The second thing is, Michael, I'm afraid nobody has heard of the Olympic truce. And I said, in the third point, oh, well, that's like that one. It's that nobody's ever heard of you either. <laughs> but apart from that, and with that ringing endorsement uh, going my way, I set off uh, on the walk uh, for truth. And again, at that point, I would submit in this debate that had there been a law which required an unfit uh, British parliamentarian to walk 3,000 miles to honor truce, I would be the first one campaigning for its abolition. <laughs> uh, but the ideal, that dream that was there from King Iphitos in 776 BC, that people could come together, not as Spartan, as Athenian, as Corinthian, as their different city-states, but come together united as Olympians and compete together as equals under the same rules, under the same laws for glory, was something that reached down the millennia to inspire me again and got me moving. And as I reached the end of my walk, towards the end, I arrived in Brussels. And with this, I will conclude. I arrived in Brussels and was asked to speak at a primary school now, politicians always get very nervous <laughs> about addressing assemblies of primary schools. And this was the British school in Brussels. And at the end of my presentation, where I talked about walking through the different countries, they said this. Uh, one little girl put her hand up. She was seven years old. And she said, um, you've walked through 15 countries. Who were the nicest and who were the nastiest? Now, of course, I could say that, of course, Greece was by far the most hospitable. I said, but you know what it is? I'd never really thought about it because everybody was just exactly the same. I walked along the highways in Greece and in every other country, and when I met people coming the other way, I smiled at them and they smiled back. I asked for directions and they did their best to help. I asked for accommodation and they asked for 50 euros. <laughs> people were exactly the same. They loved their countries. They thought that their country was the most beautiful. They thought their culture was the most rich. They thought their fighting men were the most courageous. They thought their women were the most beautiful. Everyone thought exactly the same. And the only thing that changed was that as you approach close to the border, uh, they would say to you in hushed tones at the final place I was staying, they would say, well, of course, you know, we're OK in this country. You can trust us, but. When you go over there, watch out, because those people will rob you, they'll take their money. And of course, they had this prejudice uh, 
uh, against other countries and against other people. And I think what we need above all in the present time is that Olympic ideal of seeing ourselves as part of something which is greater than a national boundary, part of civilization, all one, exactly the same, living under the same rules, living in harmony. That is a peace which can inspire and has inspired. Thank you. I did not uh, say it earlier. Uh, Lord Bates is a member of the House of Lords, and he actually, uh, actually participated in this walk of truth. Uh, Mr. Athanasios Platias, Director of the Department of International and European Studies and Professor of Strategic University of Piraeus. Mr. Platias, since Afghanistan, uh, uh, why did not Afghani uh, Afghanistan became Switzerland? What went wrong in that case? First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, uh, this invitation. I find uh, debates much more useful than uh, truce, Olympic truce. At the golden peace. That's no joke. When World War started, World War I, almost a century ago, and then we had World War II, these two wars created 65 million of dead people. It took 65 million of lives. And now, with nuclear technology, you can easily imagine what you would have happened, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, if it has escalated. That could have been the end of the planet. So we're talking about an important subject matter, and I think we take it very lightly here. I think war is a disease, and we have to fight the medicine. And I think the proposition is offering an aspirin to treat a cancer, and that's very dangerous for the patient. We will argue that peace can be enforced and the possibilities of being inspired are very slim. I hope it was that easy. I hope I would send Lord Bates to talk to Osama bin Laden, to talk to Stalin, to talk to Hitler, and try to inspire him. I hope we will go to talk to Assad in Syria to try to inspire him. And one example of the inspiration that has been used is the Olympic truce. But I think it's an incredible organized hypocrisy. I mean, nine, one, 93 countries signed the Olympic truce. One of them is Russia. And Russia picked the day that the Pekin Olympics started to invade to Georgia. To Georgia. And then Russia signs the Olympic truce, and we are happy. Syria try, signs the Olympic truce, and we are happy. And then look what is happening. In other words, this is PR. And I think it's very dangerous to left peace to PR activities. I think we should treat the issues of war and peace much more carefully. OK, the proposition assumes that inspiration can work. This means there is no conflict of interest. But life is full conflict of interest. Life is full of antagonism. When you have competition and conflict of interest, sometimes Things escalate, and there are competitions over territory, over resources, over power, over prestige. And sometimes this escalates. So what can be done? The proposition is saying we can change the mind of the person. We can inspire him. It looks like a priest going and through oh, talk take the evil out of the person and makes it a good person. I wish it was that easy. It's very difficult to change. And it's very difficult to, to eliminate conflicts of interest. And to make things further, if you try, more difficult for the 
proposition. If you go and talk to a terrorist and try to inspire him, he will take your approach as a weakness. He will think that you try to appeasement, and appeasement is a core of war. Weakness is a cause of war. And Lord Bates should have known that when his country tried appeasement, you tried to appease Hitler, if you remember. And when Chamberlain returned home, he was using similar expressions like the ones that we hear today. He said, the peace of our time, go home and sleep quietly in your bed. I have done it, I have fixed it, I have done peace with Hitler. And six months later, we had World War II. And precisely this approach was one of the cause of war. So appeasement can be dangerous. And trying to talk to terrorists, trying to talk to dictators can be very, very dangerous indeed. OK. The basic mistake of the proposition is that it treats war at the level of the individual. But war is a social phenomenon. It's a political phenomenon. War is really an instrument of the state to achieve its objective. War is something that community states fight. It's not an individual. The individual is irrelevant in that case. The cause of war is located within societies. The cause of war is militarism, nationalism, expansionism, imperialism. This has nothing to do with persons. OK, go and talk to Hitler. You change the mind of the Hitler, Hitler becomes irrelevant. The Nazi, ex the Nazi regime is expansionistic. And the expansion will happen because it's militaristic, it's nationalistic, it's expansionistic. So what you do with the individual is completely irrelevant. Given this problem, how we treat it? One possible treat can be at this domestic level. For example, through democracy, we can manage to deal with nationalism and militarism. But I think most of the responses have to come at the international level. And I think the international community has instruments to cause the, to, to deal with this problem, to treat this cancer. You at the international level, one minute left. At the international level, we have two basic instruments, balance of power. Look an example, the concert of Europe in 1815. I mean, five great powers get together. If somebody tries to, to make war, they all work against him. That's the balance of power mechanism. Or there is a collective security mechanism like the, in the UN. If you have any doubt about whether peace can be enforced, look what happened to Germany after it made three wars. The German-Prussian War, World War I, World War II. Germany was forced to become a peaceful country. The beast was transformed. How? Through enforcement. Up to almost 20 years ago, Germany, up to 89, with the end of the Berlin War, Germany was under occupation by four countries, including your country. The same thing happened to Japan. If you have any doubts about peace and formen, ask Gaddafi, ask Saddam Hussein, ask Milosevic. So my point is that peace can be enforced, and we have a lot of examples that peace can be enforced. OK, to conclude, idealism and utopianism yeah. is dangerous. First point. Second, you don't treat cancer with aspirin because it kills the patient. And third, peace is too important to be left to the hands of the public relation project, like the Olympic truce. Thank you. To eponimo to timisa de kire platia. You honored your surname. Uh, you exceeded your time, Mr. Platias. Well, you were rather uh, cruel. Uh, actually, I keep the PR uh, remark of this uh, truce uh, you've mentioned. Of course, uh, when you have a 93 uh, states signing, most of them 
actually uh, take their signature back. You said the example of Russia. Uh, well, it, that's a big question. Yes, uh, you've got a strong arguments. Let's see what Mr. Economides has to say about that. So, let's see how P Mr. Uh, Peter Economides, brand strategist, uh, founder and uh, president of Felix BNI, and it is uh, the question in economy of Twitter. Is it possible to do that? Uh, the answer is, of course, it can be done. And my favorite Olympian is right here, Fanny Halkia. Thanks for being here. Professor Platias, if Hitler, Stalin, and Hassad had been exposed to Olympic truce as children, they might not have become Hitler, Stalin, and Assad. And on your other point, that it's a societal issue, individuals make up society. Individuals make it up. And today's social world, individuals have power. And you should speak to Mubarak about that. And of course, to Gaddafi, if you could have found him. I'd like you all, please, to reach out your hands to the people sitting on each side of you and just hold hands for a second. Just hold hands with those on each side of you. Just hold hands. You're doing it across the aisle. That's fantastic. Holding of hands. This is the root meaning of the word ekehiria. And when you're holding hands, how on earth can you fight? When you're holding hands and looking to the eyes of the other, how on earth can you fight? The answer is, you can't. There is a second interpretation of the word ekihiria, by the way, and it is equally powerful. It means to hold back one's hands. In other words, hands off your weapons. In other words, hands off your enemy. Such smart stuff, such simply smart stuff, which, by the way, says yinete, if anyone wants to hear that word. And it immediately brings to mind the words of Robert Kennedy. Let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Greece has given many great things to the world. One of the greatest is the Olympic Games, Olympism, the Olympic ideals, and the Olympic truce. At a time when the world needs inspiration for peace, the world needs the ideals of Olympism and the Olympic truce. Truce inspires peace, and its inspiration allows the foundation, and this is more important, on which to build a culture of peace, intolerant of conflict, hatred, and division, to prevent Hitler's and Stalin's and Assad's from ever emerging. I consider myself lucky. I've worked with many great people on many great projects for many of the world's greatest brands. But one of the greatest of all has been the International Olympic Truth Center, which I've been involved with since its inception in the year 2000. And I've been involved in the best way, with passion. One of the reasons is this. I was born in South Africa, apartheid South Africa. A beautiful country filled with beautiful people of all colors and religions living under an extremely ugly regime. South Africa was paradise, a comfortable place if you were born with a white skin. It was hell, a nightmare if you were black. A country of institutionalism, of institutionalized racism, reinforced by law and the Constitution. And in the case of the Dutch Reformed Church, by religion too. Separate residential areas, separate transportation, separate schools, separate restaurants, beaches, and cinemas, believe it or not, separate places of worship, as though God has a color, a system designed to minimize interaction between black and white, and with something called the Immorality Act, listen to this, which actually made interracial sex, and therefore interracial love, a criminal offense punishable with imprisonment. How ridiculous. Marriage between black and white, forget about it. 
an abnormally savage place which in the mind of a young child represented the way the world was. How could we know better? It was illegal to know better. Two days ago, I met a fellow South African. She hadn't been back for many years. I go back every year. She said to me, what has changed down there? I said, my young nephew has a best friend who is black. That is a huge change in that country. It could never have happened. Let's backtrack down to, back to 1994. Apartheid was abolished. For the first time in forever, all people were equal in the eyes of the law. Theoretically, theoretically at least, the source of conflict had been eliminated. Peace had been enforced. But there was no guarantee that years of oppression would not lead to the explosion of a truly destructive, devastating bomb filled with hatred and revenge. Peace was inspired in the form of Nelson Mandela. I want to draw a distinction here in leaders and those who lead. There are leaders and there are those who lead, and this is not a semantic distinction. Leaders are in positions of authority. We follow them because we have to. We need to. They enforce themselves upon us. And then there are those who lead. We follow them because we want to. We choose to because they inspire us. We follow those who lead not for them, but for ourselves. And this makes all the difference. Peace cannot be enforced. Peace must be inspired. We need to want peace for ourselves. Lasting peace can only come about this way because we want it. Nelson Mandela understood that. And King Ifitos understood that. The oracle said to him, have games. And the first Olympic Games were organized in 7076 BC. A truce was declared. And this is how mortal enemies became sporting adversaries as they competed vigorously, I might add, at the ancient Olympic Games. It's how Jesse Owens and Lutz Long in Berlin, an African-American and a blonde Aryan, became lifelong friends. It wouldn't have happened. It's also how conflict ceased long enough in Sarajevo in 1994 to allow thousands of young children to be inoculated. We have all witnessed humanity in all its beautiful diversity, marching into the stadium as one, and we've all been inspired to wonder, why can't it always be like this? Imposition is an expression of hard power. People respond to hard power because they have to. Inspiration is an expression of soft power, and people respond to it because they want to. Its pull is magnetic. Its charm is charismatic. That is why soft power, at the end of the day, is infinitely more powerful than hard power because it builds culture. It shapes society by shaping the attitudes and behavior of the individuals within that society. Much of the work of the Olympic Truce Center is focused on building culture, working with future generations to prevent future Hitlers, bridging the gaps between the Olympic Games when we all naturally get inspired, inspired by the spectacle with educational programs, schools, universities, creating an everyday culture of peace, building a generation who will choose peace. A culture whose only intolerance will be the intolerance of intolerance. A culture which will seek out what unites, understand and accept, respect and appreciate that which divides. A culture which will allow deep friendships to blossom, like the one between Jesse Owens and Lutz Long, and between my nephew and his best friend, Sipo. John Lennon saying, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine peace. Thank you very much. We would like uh, to thank uh, Peter Economidis. Peter actually asked, uh, well, uh, he uh, actually expressed uh, a, another uh, question, uh, leadership and society. And if I understood well, uh, Peter, uh, whether uh, we can inspire peace, how we can have that uh, if on, we cannot have a social uh, a key to put it this way, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Maria Daniela Maruda is invited to the podium, lecturer of the international law. Uh, 
So could we have prevented uh, Hitler uh, he, uh, from becoming Hitler if we have inspired him as a child with different values, values uh, of open societies, not like uh, the ones Mr. Economides uh, described that, uh, when he was a child? Could we have uh, prevented uh, wars? topic which is very very important at this moment and at all moments in the history of mankind I will try first to to answer whether Afghanistan is Switzerland today and try to answer with a question was it before because we always have to compare with what the situation was before the armed conflict and what the obje objective of the United Nations and the international community is today. And the same for Libya and other places in the world, or even South Africa. And um, on whether without enforcement you would have, th have the opportunity to have Nelson Mandela out, outside of the jail and have him inspire in the world. So enforcement was the necessary step to be able to have Nelson Mandela inspiring. So we are not saying that inspiration is out of the picture, but enforcement has to be there before that. It has to be quick. It is necessary. It's justifiable. It's important. And I will begin with... Uh, three very quick images already we have we have said the first and the second day of the olympic games in london this year we had the hugest massacres of civilians by the assad regime in syria the second image in mali two days ago the rebels controlling the north decided that the football playing and watching football on television is very dangerous and they decided to, to impose a ban on football. And they considered this as part of the war idea in Mali. And in Somalia, a few months ago, a suicide bomber entered an, um, a hall like we are here today in a medical school graduation of students, the first one after 15 years, and exploded, killing 19 students that were ready to go and work in Somalia for the first time after 50 years, doctors in Mogadishu, plus the Minister of uh, Health, the Minister of Education and Injury, the Minister of Sports. Can you really inspire peace, justice, democracy, or any other ideal in such a situation of complete lack of rational thinking? Inspiration needs freedom of thinking in the first place, of expression, freedom from poverty. It needs human rights and democracy and justice. And can we really wait for these ideals to be inspired and then put in place while at the same time hundreds of people are killed on a daily basis? Or do we need to really concentrate our efforts to make the international system on enforcing the peace that is already in place work and work efficiently? In a more personal note, I have been working with the Red Cross in conflicts around the world. And I was inspired by ideals and values to be there. But when I went there in a conflict situation, and the objective was a two-hour morning ceasefire to evacuate wounded and sick and to bring humanitarian aid in, or to establish protection zones for the safety of, of, of civilians, or to have the parties to the conflict negotiate around a peace table for a truce or a peace. They are different, but one has to come first, always. So ceasefire first, then truce, then peace agreement, negotiations, and then peace agreements. You needed the law. You needed the imposition of the law. You needed to discuss about the obligations of the parties to the conflict to be able to proceed. So idealism and pragmatism have to go together. They are not separate. And through enforcement means that are there. The international community has the institutional capacity to enforce peace. It has a wide array of coercive measures to use to enforce peace. We can do it. Otherwise, peace will remain an ideal, a dream. And this is not what we want. We want peace to be established here and now. We want war to stop, violence to stop here and now. Indeed, there are a number of success stories of enforcement uh, of peace in Libya, the most recent example. It's not Switzerland today either, but there is no war going on. And compare it, try to compare it with the days Gaddafi regime was bombing daily civilians. The international community said that 
when the state, the Security Council of the United Nations said that, when a state is unable or are willing to protect its own citizens, international community not only has the right, but it has the obligation, the responsibility to enforce peace, to restore a breach of peace. It's not only uh, success stories. I have to admit, Rwanda and Syria are failure stories of the enforcement mechanism. This is all the more helping us show what does it mean not to have the imposition of enforcement, not to have enforcement mechanisms. What happens today in Syria is that nobody can discuss even a ceasefire of certain hours. And this is because of the lack of political will of states. Now, Sudan and Darfur is an intermediate situation. Very interesting case scenario. No use of force was used, but all the other measures international community disposes was used in Darfur. Peacekeepers of the African Union and very important regional organization of the area economic and arms embargo by the Security Council, criminal prosecution of al-Bashir before the International Criminal Court as personal individual responsible for genocide. And although it was a slow pace, although neither Sudan became Switzerland, today we have three peace agreements where all different armed groups in, in Sudan did sign, and we also have a new state, South Sudan, because of these enforcement measures. So, it's very important to see the use of force as uh, one way when a state is unable or unwilling and through United Nations. When the Security Council cannot act, you always have the General Assembly. It only happened one, but once, but why not more than once in Korea, with Uniting for Peace resolution, which was very important and it authorized use of force. You also have African Union, which has a very important statute Article 4, paragraph H, saying that if there are grave circumstances, there is a right of intervention to member states of the African Union in Africa to restore peace. This is very important. We do have the means to do it. We also have a number of sanctions, sanctions that are not so much referring to use of force, diplomatic, political, or even smart sanctions targeting individuals. And then there I come to the idea where individuals come into place. What these smart sanctions do is that they target members of the governments, of elites. They freeze assets, they ban traveling, like for the members of the family of Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein in Iraq or Milosevic or the Taliban all in all. So these smart sanctions name and shame. And they push, they put pressure on leaders to come to negotiation table and to decide and agree upon the peace agreement. So we do not think that inspiration by itself, alone, not only as a prevention measure, but by itself cannot answer uh, the problem civilians face all around the, the world at this moment because it works with individuals and not with states and other collective entities, because it works when democracy, peace, and prosperity are already there, and not when, not when governments, rebels, and people strive for their own existence. And the international community has the means to enforce peace. It can do so, and it even has the obligation to do so when a state is unable or unwilling. Thank you very much. Quite an interesting approach uh, from Mrs. Uh, Daniela Maruda. And now I need to tell you, I need to remind you that before we enter the room, we have voted 65.6% uh, uh, in favor. 30.4% uh, against, and the rest, 4% uh, is uh, absent. The ones who voted here, you increased by 0.6% in favor of the motion, 26% uh, is against uh, the motion, and the 8% uh, are the ones who haven't decided yet. So, as you can understand, uh, Mr. Platia, Mrs. Uh, Maruda, the challenge continues for you too. 
you need to persuade uh, in your second speeches uh, and, and see if this percentage can change. Now let's go to your questions. We will uh, receive questions from the Twitter, from people uh, who write uh, uh, with the hashtag uh, IQ2 piece. Uh, well, let's see if there are uh, questions. Uh, well, to the lady here. I'm Luki Kuchokostas. I'm a professional writer, a community advocate, specializing in uh, integration. Uh, my question is for Lord Bates. I'd like you to please expand on your opening train of thought that peace isn't the absence of fighting, but that it entails a whole infrastructure. As you said, justice, education, sport, welfare, and as you said, fairness. Surely the infrastructure of peace can be enforced and must be enforced. Thank you. Thank you. Επόμενος, ο κύριος παρακαλώ εδώ. Μάλλον μιας... Α, ωραία, ναι, ναι, ναι. The next one. For Mr. Peter Economides. Um, education kind of takes a long while to work, so do you mind while you educate if the rest of us bomb somebody to peace? Since we are in this group, any other questions for the speakers in favor? The lady. I'd like to ask the panel, all four, what came first, peace or war? Isn't war enforced on a peaceful nation? Weren't we born peaceful? And then various things in life turned you into hostilities and made, um, and I believe that war was enforced and therefore peace had to be enforced later in order to, to quell the, law, the wars. This is the first uh, three questions. I don't know who would like to start. Uh, uh, Lord Bates, you've got the floor for these questions. So I think the question which was directed to me was just to expand upon uh, the point of enforcement. I think that there is a, a difference here between what I call uh, enforcement and how peace is upheld within a community. Now, the upheld element is the inspiration element. Um, and I think this is the line of thought that we're going down, which is to say that peace comes from within us. It is inspiration, uh, inspire is from the Greek uh, to breathe uh, and therefore it is something which is uh, it is within us that comes out within a community and I think that that is what democracy is I think that is what law is I think that's what mutuality is and respect and community is it is something coming within us uh, into our uh, community and I think that the idea that somehow and I think this is the danger which people head into when they assume that there are these people in a predefined uh, geographic area who are pure evil, and there are these people <laughs> in another area who are pure good. It was Solzhenitsyn who reminded us that the line between good and evil passes not through religions uh, or through states, but through each and every human heart. And therefore, I come back to the point to say that is why the individual isn't just important, it is fundamental to peace and fundamental to inspiring peace. No, no. Any other questions? Ah, since you are closer. to ask a question to, the, to, to Ms. Maruda, Ms. Platias. I believe in forcing peace is a little bit utopic. And the reason is because if we scale it down to, a, for example, a match of um, a football, there is a lot of hatred inside this, uh, this stadium. You enforce peace by, by actually um, separating the two teams apart from each other. But it's not true peace. There is peace there, but it's not true peace. It's enforced and it's utopic. If you let them sit side by side, for example, probably it will have been 
better, probably. I'm not saying that it. Um, thank you. Κυρία Κρυβός, Αντικριστά, αν θέλετε σε λίγο να το πάρουμε δύο-τρεις ερωτήσεις μας. Ms. Antonia Dimu, and I work with the CIMED, University of California, Los Angeles. Well, my, thank, first of all, I would like to thank you for your excellent presentations. And my question is addressed to each one of you. Um, many times in your presentations you referred uh, to Syria. And um, also, um, there was specific reference to the um, international level and tools which are existent in order to enforce or inspire peace. According to the American Pentagon, peace enforcement entails the physical interposition uh, of armed forces between ongoing combatants to establish a ceasefire that does not exist. Um, according to the United Nations, which has been referred immensely in the presentations, peace enforcement refers to efforts to prevent a ceasefire from collapsing or to reinstate a failed ceasefire. With that in mind, let's go today to the situation in Syria. The August 15th report of the International Independent Commission inquiry on Syria blames both government forces and armed opposition groups for the massacre in Hula. Um, at the same time, the report says that violence has increased in intensity and spread into new areas since February 2012, and that although the opposition is not party to the Geneva Conventions, it has to uh, abide by the, the rules of the international humanitarian law. Uh, given that in mind, and uh, also given the increasing death toll in Syria nowadays, can you please comment that can international efforts to impose or um, to create a ceasefire in Syria succeed through peace enforcement or through peace inspiration? Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want, we will go to the next round of questions. For these questions, uh, please, uh, Mr. Platias, Mrs. Maruda, comments. If you let them sit next to each other, they will be killed. It's as simple as that. So it's better than having casualties is to separate them. Of course, we would have love that they don't hate each other, but it's the essence of the competition to hate each other. They define themselves by hating the other team more than they love their team. And so competition is endemic. Now, is it utopic to separate them? Yes. You don't solve the problem, but you can solve it. I mentioned two great examples of social and political engineering. We took the beast, Germany, and we rehabilitated it. Germany was a beast for a century, and now it's a peaceful country. It's a democratic country playing with the rules. Germany underwent an intense rehabilitation. The same thing happened to Japan. So it's not only separating them, it's also change them. And you give them stick and carrot. I still think it's completely wrong to concentrate at the level of the individual. The, it, we wish we could have made the individual different, but that would have mattered? Yes, only if it was democracy. Without Hitler living in a democracy, even if we have, through your education, rehabilitated him, your education would have been irrelevant. The dictator in Germany would have decided. So it's not necessary to focus on the individual, but the aggregate, if the regime allows the aggregation of the voice of the individual. That's why I offer as a solution to this disease democracy and strengthening of the international institution and not take them to the Sunday school and preach them love. Thank you. Um, um, thank you very much for the questions. First of all, with football and uh, the utopia from the four presentations, you consider utopia on our side? <laughs> because this was interesting. Uh, I would more, uh, when it comes to football game, concentrate on fair play. 
If you manage to have fair play and those who violate fair play, you punish, you already are in the sphere of enforcement. So try to work with this analogy better. Secondly, there are international tools and they are successful if they are put into place. For Syria, you mentioned two definitions of enforcement. There is a third one, actually. And this already uh, shows uh, how many problems we have with definitions, with different ideas, with different priorities. There is a third one saying that even though enforcement as is associated often with authority and with violence, in the context of conflicts and peace, it's more important the pressure, how you compel parties to come into the negotiating table and have an increased cooperation that will bring about a ceasefire, a truce, and a peace agreement. So what we strive for in, in Syria is um, an opportunity to impose the, these mechanisms, to have an increased cooperation of the parties to the conflict. If this cannot happen through the Security Council, it can happen through the General Assembly. Already, the second day of the Olympic Games, again, the General Assembly issued a resolution uh, according to which resolution uh, there should be an imposition of peace asking the Security Council to do it. There is a possibility institutionally in the United Nations to have the majority of states in the, Secret in the General Assembly to authorize imposition of measures for Syria. So this is a way out. Peter, um, I, I first of all want to address the question that was directed uh, to me in the first round of questions about whether I would agree with simply bombing because education takes a long time. Certainly not. Certainly not. Um, I think that, you know, in those kind of situations. By the way, an enforced peace, in my opinion, and I think here comes a definition of what peace really is, an enforced peace, in my opinion, is not a peace because it is not long lasting. If it does not come from inside, it is not a peace. It is not a peace. Um, Another issue that I wanted to address was the, the, uh, the point of view put forward by Professor Platias that competition is endemic. And I want to relate this back to hooliganism in, in the stadiums. Why is it that at the Olympic Games, which are conducted within the spirit and the ideals of Olympism, there is no hooliganism? Why is that? Is it that spirit that pervades? That is precisely the spirit that Olympic truce seeks to push out into society. I want to address a third point, which was a point that you raised back there, about whether war or peace is the natural state of man. Personally, I believe that peace is. And in fact, rebranding peace, to pick up what you said, Nikos, is more about rebranding our attitude towards conflict and towards war. Um, just to briefly uh, add to uh, add to those points, I do think that um, there was a very uh, <clears throat> interesting point in the case of Syria to say that uh, is there a comparison into the level of resource that we put behind things? When I commenced my walk. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why I commenced my walk was because I was seeking to persuade uh, the United Kingdom government, uh, who have since repented of their sin and uh, uh, come behind the initiative in a wonderful way, uh, but I was seeking to persuade them to invest uh, £20 million in a project uh, to promote peace and reconciliation under the Olympic truce. And I failed. And, uh, and then, uh, a week later, uh, uh, there was a resolution about Libya uh, that uh, went through the United Nations Security Council. It was passed by 10 people, not the 193 countries that had backed the Olympic truce. And within a weekend, we were able to assemble a navy, <laughs> uh, a billion dollar budget that apparently we found from uh, somewhere, and were able to have incredible international cooperation to, to go in in a military way. And my argument is this, is if only we gave a chance to putting the same resources uh, 
behind peace and peace building that we put behind war, then we might find that it has more effect. If we took some of the $118 billion, which the US government alone is spending in Afghanistan each year, and spent some of that into efforts to bring about peace in Syria, we might get a different result. The problem is that we have become obsessed with military solutions. And when you are a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Quite an interesting uh, discussion, but uh, since it is 20 to 9 uh, and we need to have the second uh, interventions, uh, but uh, I want you to be brief uh, in with your uh, questions. We have two gentlemen up front. Okay, my name is Ulysses Gangas. I'm the director of the International Olympic Academy. And of course, I'm in favor of the inspiration and not of the enforcement. But let me put the question in Greek so I can win the votes of some people that they don't have, um, you know, the, all the system to hear and listen in English. I'll say it in Greek. To uh, enforcement. So, enforcement and inspiration are two concepts, my dear colleagues. Maria and Thanasis, which cannot be compatible with one another. Enforcement follows the violation of specific rules of conduct which should be compatible with human nature so that we can characterize them as either negative or positive. Therefore, all Enforcement attempts have failed, because, but uh, no efforts for inspiration have been made so far. So why not allow ourselves to give humans the opportunity, not leaders such as uh, Stalin and Hitler, but humans, why not give humans the opportunity to experience uh, peace and educate them on something which has not been learned throughout the centuries? What is that? Their conduct in a society. Mr. Platias gave me the perfect example when referring to Olympic and Panathinaikos fans. He said that they cannot sit next to one another within the football court because they will fight. Why is that? Because the Olympic ideals was never taught to these fans. They were never taught how to behave towards one another within a society. So why not give inspiration a chance? Why rely on enforcement? Um, please be brief. Brief? Yes, please. Okay, so my name is Perakis. I'm a professor at Pantheon University. Uh, being a professor, uh, it is implied that I believe in education and culture of peace. I happen to believe in uh, human rights as well. I feel that uh, the two speakers who were for the motion were oversimplified, oversimplified their speeches. Uh, during his walk from Olympia to London, uh, Lord uh, uh, Bates uh, could have taken uh, another direction. They could have went the other way to Eastern Europe where conflicts uh, are vivid. He could have visited Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, or uh, Tajikistan and uh, Chechnya, or uh, even in Asia. He could have uh, went to the end of Africa, uh, Somalia, Mali. He could have met with um, the guerrillas there. So I think that in the last uh, 2,500 years, uh, the peace years are very few. They amount only to 250. 
we will keep on fighting for peace. But uh, do you actually believe that Nelson Mandela was uh, a triumph of peace or of human rights? Before you answer uh, and uh, tell me that peace uh, goes together, goes along with human rights and uh, safety and security, uh, you should uh, keep in mind that there is uh, also a different approach that we should follow worldwide. Uh, the right wing uh, talked about international peace because uh, we can have social peace within a specific society or family peace or uh, sports peace. But what uh, the Olympic movement seeks is uh, a peace at international level. And what uh, my dear Lord UNESCO has failed to achieve since 1945 in a movement of which I am also a member as a professor, what uh, it has failed to do is it has failed to change uh, mentalities and inspire. So let's talk about UNESCO. No, I didn't only talk about UNESCO. The gentleman here. Um, Hello, I am Georgios Gallos from Ceres. Uh, I voted for the motion, but I will now change my vote and vote against it. The issue as uh, approached is what happens in education. Well, I am a teacher and uh, I have a class. For example, in gymnastics, uh, a, a child um, is very naughty and uh, we asked uh, as an expert what to do with this child. He told us that there is uh, something you can do, you can inspire him, you can teach him and it will be a time-consuming effort, but you will get there, you will achieve your objective. The other approach is that you will punish it, you will tell, it, uh, tell the child sit there and don't go out on a break. But uh, the problem with the first approach is that uh, while trying to educate this one child, all the class will suffer from, uh, the dis from his disorderly conduct. So what is it that we wish for? Do we want a class uh, that uh, is reconciled or um, uh, in time, or do we want a class that will suffer from one specific naughty child? Okay. Uh, your example was very vivid. Uh, one last question, please, before the replies of our speakers. The lady over there. Thank you. To both the speakers of the proposition. So you both mentioned that the desire for peace is something universal and an inherent characteristic of man. So how exactly does that explain the numerous conflicts that we see not only today but throughout human history and many of which were brought up by all four speakers and secondly how does it exist the ex how does it explain the existence and the need for so many enforcement mechanisms such as the UN the sanctions the international court of justice surely if inspiration was sufficient then the global his history and current affairs would be strikingly different isn't that so lord bates and mr economy Let's move on to the replies of both sides and then we will have another round of questions and we will also have questions from Facebook and Twitter. So, Peter. Put the kid in his place, right? But understand that you haven't achieved that much. That to truly change the behavior of the kid, inspire him, change him from within, which is what Lord Bates was speaking about. That would be my advice. But in the meantime, put him in his place. Don't bomb him, for God's sake. Lord Bates. <laughs> so, Lord Bates. Efforts still now. Why? No, no, why well, on, the, not on the UNESCO uh, efforts, I, I accept it. I mean, last week in Parliament, I was hosting a UNESCO visit from 16 nations of Olympic truce ambassadors. 
uh, that UNESCO was doing. Now, we had people there from many conflict uh, parts of the world. And sure, it's a small thing. It's a very, very small thing uh, to, uh, to build like that. In some ways, it's very easy, isn't it, to, uh, to, to reach for violence uh, or to reach for enforcement if you can exercise control. But I think that that was an example. Uh, of it, I think in terms of uh, uh, the route for my walk, uh, <laughs> I think that was a very uh, a good point uh, uh, about it. I did spend two weeks during the Olympics in the Bekar Valley, uh, seeking to access into Syria, uh, but unable to do so, working with refugees uh, under the UNHCR, and hearing at first hand uh, what, was, uh, what was happening there. And uh, so I understand just a little uh, of that uh, of that situation. Um, and as relates to the uh, point uh, which was made um, about uh, the institutions, the institutions being evidenced that, uh, uh, in a sense, we can't be trusted with our own future. Well, you know, I suppose many people might say that uh, you know, democracy isn't such a great ideal. But it happens to be the best system of running a country uh, that we have, apart from all the rest that have been considered and tried. Um, so the fact that there are people uh, who cross the boundaries, uh, I think, uh, doesn't negate uh, the arguments for inspiring and upholding peace. Uh, it just means that we have to work that much harder. Thank you. Thank you. Ο Διονύσης Γάγκας έθεσε ένα... Διονύσης Γάγκας asked a question that surprised me. He said that the, the enforcement of law has failed. If it has failed, there are no reason for states to exist. The existence of state requires that you have a mechanism with police, uh, uh, courts, parliaments that legislate that set rules of behavior and the state does not expect us to love each other but to, to behave in a friendly way towards other not be hostile that is how we maintain internal peace so a state a peaceful uh, state uh, have So he has changed into English now. And precisely as that young student implied, out there it's competition, it's work, it's zugla. That's the natural state of nature. So how we get out of this situation? We created states. That's the basic insight of your great philosopher Hobbes. We created authority that put an end to the civil war and to live in peace, even if we don't love each other. But we live in peace. And our side said, what states have done domestically, let's do it at the international level. Let's strengthen international institutions. That's precisely the argument that we made. And talking about South Africa, I mean, and the Mandela stuff, in my mind, in my mind, What I have as the critical force of change in South Africa is not just the inspiration, which is nice, but it was the pressure of the international community through embargoes all these years that created incentives for domestic change. So you cannot underestimate even in South Africa, that seems to be a great example of inspiration, the importance of the international community and the international institutions or treasury. But again, going to, to, to the bigger picture, what is the cause? Is it at the level of the individual that you try through education to treat it? My answer is it would have nice to do it, it would have been nice to work, but that's too dangerous for societies to stay at that level. If it works fine, we will be happy. But what if we have conflict of interest and this doesn't work? We have to create mechanisms. And therefore, we created the concept of the state. Unfortunately, the international community is weak. 
We don't have world government. We have not the equivalent of the domestic state. And it's very difficult to go on world government, but we can go along the path of strengthening international institutions. And this will bring peace. And to have the individual count, we have to bring democracy first. Therefore, the recipe is not just educating the individual, but bringing the political preconditions that the educated individual can play a role. Therefore, the medicine is at the level of the society, is democracy. And the third medicine is economic interdependence. When you tie economic interests, people don't fight with each other. And that's the three elements that I have outlined, strengthening international institutions, strengthening democracy, and strengthening economic interdependence. Is this utopian? No, it isn't. We see it here in Europe. That's the recipe of the European success. Because it's not inspiration. It's economic interdependence. It's democracy and strong international institutions. The other, the soft things, come on top. But what I said is the hard thing that created the lasting peace. Να προτείνω σαν γενική τοποθέτηση. Μάλλον, θα έχετε ένα δίλεπτο. You will have two minutes, all of you, to have uh, to wrap up with the final voting. Until then, let's answer the questions briefly and actually uh, stop commenting. Do you want to add something? The way you look at me, I need to say no. Since Mr. Gagas asked me, I will be brief. Let's leave some space to inspiration. Who has stopped inspiration all this period? Inspiration hasn't stopped, but it cannot operate if we cannot stop violence. We need to have peace and then we will proceed with the rest. So, let's go to the last uh, uh, cycle of questions. No comments, just questions, please. We see a lot of hands. Peaceful places. Uh, the ugly and nasty civil war of Lebanon, for example, would have been avoided should the Christians of the country have not armed and defend themselves. The abyss of cemetery would be at the place of a very nasty civil war. In situations of occupation, it is liberation rather than peace that is the highest value. So, when the synonym of peace is subjection and the synonym of war is freedom, then the peace rhetoric becomes a normative instrumental of philandization, an instrument of hegemony. Is this the kind of peace you want to inspire? Thank you. Can I, can I go ahead? Okay. Dr. Paravantis of the, excuse me? Yes, yes, excuse me. This is Dr. John Paravantis of the Department of International and European Studies of the University of Piraeus. I'm asking this question mostly of the uh, gentleman representing the idealist positions. As the night draws to a close, I'd like to try to compel you gentlemen to a clearer position. So I'm asking you, being an engineer in an international relations department, we have the idea of peace present in the world for a couple of thousand years. How many more years must pass before it actually, there is at least one example where it has been successfully inspired. In other words, we have an null hypothesis that says that it can be inspired. Where are the data supporting this hypothesis? Thank you. Uh, my question uh, is addressing to uh, uh, Mr. Platias and Ms. Maruda. Uh, I think that uh, I believe that there is a lack of definition of what is peace. I was a Navy officer, Hellenic Navy officer, for 37 years. One example. Is there peace between Greece and Turkey? Of course, there is no hostility. There are no hostilities. But is there peace uh, between uh, Greece and Turkey? Because 37 years in the Navy, I never felt that there was peace. Thank you. Two more questions. 
if you are covered by previous uh, people who have asked something, please don't uh, ask. Can I choose uh, between you two? Questions directed to Lord Bale. Uh, ba Sorry, wrong. Lord Bates. Uh, you said that America gives a uh, 118 billion uh, for Afghanistan, and they should put some of it towards Syria. Uh, but from what I understood until now, uh, your the inspiration side is a more long-term solution. But what you said presented it as a more short-term. So I just want to know, like, what would they do to inspire Syria with that money right now, as it is, and how would that help them? Taskalipse. Are you covered by the speaker? No. Okay, so I'll take one more. And respecting state sovereignty. But as we spoke a lot about Syria, I just want to ask, in situations where, the, where NATO and the Security Council are very clearly not willing to help, like less alarming situations, but as important for example, Palestine, what do you do? Do you wait for years for people to remain displaced and Israel settlements to ever expand and over increase? Or do you intervene in a coercive or non coercive way? Two more questions, and that's it, please. The gentleman uh, here on the left, uh, and uh, you will get the microphone. To those speaking against the motion, it was said that peace cannot exist until violence is stopped, but really the only means of stopping violence is the potential for greater violence, to be the stronger force to step in and say no. Now, within that, uh, that situation in the international community, how do you enforce peace without choosing winners and losers in the conflict? Uh, the U.S. has been doing this for decades and has earned the, the resentment and hostility of a large part of the world as a result. Um, and also, is it even conceivable that the international community can reliably distinguish between say, a freedom fighter and a terrorist? And is that not simply a matter of PR? Excellent question, the previous one, Vagelis Davidis, editor of uh, Ipovrichio. Mr. Platias, 25 years ago, the fans of Olympiakos and Panathinaikos would watch the football game together. Two questions. What we heard from Lord Bates at the beginning was extremely important. He said that peace is not lack of violence, it is the presence of justice as well. We talk about peace enforcement a lot, but let's talk about war imposement, how we can avoid a war which is imposed uh, from economic uh, interests uh, uh, like the one we experienced in Iraq uh, with the Bush administration. Second question, how can you have peace enforcement in Syria and in Libya, but not only there, how you can have peace uh, uh, with Hrisi uh, Avigi, extreme uh, right uh, wing uh, uh, party in Greece, which actually um, supports hatred. We have the questions from Twitter and Facebook. For those in favor. on annihilating whoever stands in their way, for example, West Barbastis and Hamas. And how many of those talking in favor of the position would go to a hotspot to talk to someone holding a gun to change their mind? So we are okay. I would suggest uh, let's do something. Well, you can either give your answer in their last uh, 
speech you have or you will give an answer and then you will uh, have a, a brief intervention. So let's start with what my friend said. I like that because substantially it uh, switches the argument. Well, he said the PR, uh, inspiring peace is PR, but uh, actually uh, enforcing uh, peace is also PR. Well, uh, from this uh, officer of the Greek Navy, that somehow he suggested that because there is a cold peace between Greece and Turkey, he felt that it was not peace. If it was war, you would have understood it first. And look what happened to Cyprus when our deterrence failed. Cyprus is occupied. You see, what I expect is not to have the Turks love us. It would have been nice. But if they don't love us for some reason, and until expect Lord Bates and Mr. Economides go and persuade them and inspire them to love us, what I want is not to invade. And for, in order not to invade, there are two ways to do it, self-defense and the pressure of the international community, participation in international organizations like NATO, the EU, and the possible pressures of the international community. And as long as we live in peace, I don't care if the Turks love me or not. I would have liked to love me, but I cannot control it. And that way I'm responding to Mr. Inconomidis that says love and peace has come from inside. Would it would be nice to happen, but maybe in paradise, not in earth. This is not how international politics works. And we are talking about war and peace, which is a matter of international policy. It's not nirvana. And what we want to create is preconditions that we don't have war, even if others don't like us. And you have to understand there are conflict of interest, conflict of economic interest, energy interest, power, prestige. We still, given this conflict of interest, we must create preconditions to live peacefully. And the only way to do it is either through self-defense, like deterrence, or having the international institutions imposing a cost of aggression. And that's our argument. OK. This interesting question whether, in case of American unipolarity, can be used for American hegemony, and uh, the Americans using their power unilaterally imposing an order on their favor. Oh, I did not mention that as a solution to the problem of war. I mention either strengthening international institutions or having a mechanism like the Concert of Europe that balance of power is working at this checking aggressor. What the Americans are doing in this period of a unique and very paradoxical period of American unipolarity is very rare. And I don't think that they can continue doing that. It's essentially one case that the balance of power is not working because you have a preponderant power, the United States, of course, using its power to impose its own interest in certain areas. But no, that's not our ideal about either strengthening of the international community or the model of balance of power that can be described. This is an anomaly, and we have to treat it that way. And by the way, it's probably having, better having this anomaly than having people killing each other in the ground. Mrs. Maruda, thank you very much. As far as the very interesting question is concerned, if enforcement you choose winners and losers. Occasionally it might seem like that by but the mechanism of enforcement uh, referred to someone who violated the international law, uh, violated human rights. Gaddafi 
uh, was not chosen as a loser because he some people did not like him but he, because he violated human rights bombarding his own citizens and then uh, the international community answered and in that it, the, and this is not pr and not questions of winner and the loser the people uh, his people did not like him he did not want him anymore and the international community supported them we had also the example of milosevic who started with this kind of actions or with saddam hussein enforcement comes when you have a violation of law the one who violates the law is the one who actually has to face the sanction and this is not pr this is how uh, order is enforced and uh, now uh, lord bates do you want to answer uh, specific questions for a statement yeah for sure λοιπόν uh, Okay. Αυτή είναι η τελική τοποθέτηση, η δευτερολογία και αμέσως μετά έρχεται η ψηφοφορία. Το αποτέλεσμα της ψηφοφορίας. I'll, I'll try and touch upon as many of the questions in, in, as I can in the two minutes to, to wind up. Um, the questions are very searching and the answers are not at all easy. Um, I do think that there is some common ground between us in that when we talk about uh, peace, if we said, can order uh, be enforced? The answer is, of course, yes. And, and I think that that is possible, but not lasting peace. And that is a key difference to us. When we talk about Germany and how it has changed its behavior as a nation, we cannot leave out the inspiration of people like uh, Robert Schuman, of Conrad Ardner, uh, of Jean Monnet, who were the founders of the economic and monetary, uh, the economic union. Uh, their vision for a different type of Europe uh, has contributed to our longest period of peace that we've had. When we talk about the fall of communism, the end of the Cold War, uh, which we talked about um, perhaps leading to the actual annihilation uh, of uh, the human race, uh, we cannot leave out the inspiration of people like Václav Havel, uh, of Lech Wałęsa, uh, of Pope John Paul II, uh, and their role in inspiring people uh, to rise up and claim their rights and to seek a peaceful coexistence uh, with these people around the world. And I'm afraid that our conflicts in Lebanon and Syria uh, and Palestine and Israel will go on as long as we wait for a similar inspirational figure to come from within and to confirm that there is a better way to a lasting peace. Thank you very much. Let's go to Ms. Daniela Maruda for her final statement. You have two minutes. I wonder how long do we have to wait for peace to come from within? Who decides whether peace is established? Because if we cannot decide on a definition, and our definition is to have a peace agreement signed and implemented, that's peace, you do not know what to ask the parties in a conflict to do. What do you ask them? What do you strive for? What does the international community do? We need to have objective criteria to be able to work in the society, convince parties in the conflict towards a certain behavior. So we need different states and actors to decide to cooperate, to negotiate and to agree on a ceasefire, to agree on a truce, to agree on a peace agreement. Sanctions and enforcement mechanisms deter escalatory behavior. They weaken party strategic, military, or economic positions. That makes all the necessary conditions for peace to prevail. This is what we need. International society will never be free from violence, poverty, or injustice. Although we can continue dreaming of a peaceful world, it is much better to strive for new avenues, avenues for improving major deficiencies of the current system of states. 
international community has set the parameters for prohibiting the use of force. It knows what are the rules, and it has to act when the rules are violated. And when peace is not there, it means that United Nations Charter is being violated. So United Nations Charter has to enforce peace, restore peace, or remove the threat of a peace. To put the basic questions of the motion a bit differently, if you allow me. And actually, our position was rather utopian. The idea is how we manage to realize utopia. This is the real challenge we have in finding ways to impose peace. Let's find ways to inspire the imposition of peace, because peace can be enforced, but it most definitely cannot be merely inspired. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Peter Economidis, two minutes for you. We need to define a couple of issues, and Lord Bates, I think, put it incredibly well. Order is what you enforce. Lasting peace can only be inspired. Because if that does not come from within, order will collapse, especially if I work with the assumption that uh, Professor, Professor Platias has been working with that war and competition is the natural state of man. Because that presupposes that we will live on a planet which will be in a constant state of war. And that takes me back to ancient Greece, which in fact was a microcosm of what I'm describing. It was a group of city-states constantly at war. And what managed to inspire some peace, or at least the preconditions for peace to have a hope of being rooted, was a thing called the Olympic Truce. I think there's something else that we need to be very mindful of. The world is changing, and it's changing rapidly. Professor Platia said in his opening remarks, he spoke about the fact that with the way the world is today, with nuclear weaponry, if the Bay of Pigs had exploded, we might have blown the entire planet up. That is true. Look at the amount of money that is going into a war machine. And then I go to Lord Bates's point about taking some of that resource and not diverting it to Syria, diverting it to a serious attempt to inspire humanity to seek peace as opposed to resolving conflict through violence. The other thing that is changing rapidly in this world is something called social media. The world is becoming a huge global village. People are communicating with each other. It is no longer a one-way street. People are empowered, which means that if you can inspire individuals, they will inspire each other. And society does have a hope of changing by inspiring peace. So my argument would be that, yes, order may need to be enforced. Peace can only be inspired. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And Mr. Platias, please sum up. You have two minutes. Well, it's not Platias that says that we are in a state of nature, of na in a state of nature that we are in a state of war. It's the empirical data that says that. It's reality. That's reality out there. And therefore, we said that that's precisely the problem that we have to treat. And what solution we have given and what solution you have given. You say inspire the mind of the individual, and we say work at the level of societies and strengthen international institutions. And in fact, we do have a common ground, as Lord Bates said. And the issue of Germany, it really illustrates our two approaches. Of course, inspiration has played a role, 2%. The other 98% is that Germany has been occupied. Germany has been locked in European institutions, both at NATO, at EU. Germany has become democratic, and therefore, Militarism and nationalism have eradicated, and we have created an economic independence in Europe that it's too costly for Germany to play the old games that it used to play. 
So that's the four medicines that I have given account 90%, 98% of the outcome. Yours account 2%. Yes, of course, you have a point, but this point is not really central. It's marginal, it's insignificant. And we come to the general conclusion, idealism and utopianism is not only relevant, can be dangerous. When you treat cancer with an aspirin, you make the patient feel good, but he dies. Therefore, you have to treat the problem and not just make him feel good. And this type of inspiration things make him feel good. It's good, it's public relation projects. And public, re and peace, and war and peace are too important to be left to public relations projects. Thank you very much, Mr. Platias. So, is aspirin the medicine for cancer? Of course not, but your own recipe, your own prescription, as followed tonight, And uh, allow me to say that you have um, also included inspiration, not only enforcement in your approach, and uh, that was the challenge for you. I think that you have managed to win it. And I think that uh, the votes for the motion uh, dropped and amount to 36%, whereas 60% is against the motion and 4% of those taking part in the vote are still at uh, undecisive uh, and abstained. So I think that there is a lot of work to be done from the IOTC. Also, allow me to add that uh, I think that what we all share tonight, the view we all share, is that uh, uh, you need to find the golden rule. Enforcement uh, may apply, but you also have to work at society level, just like Peter and Lord Bates said, in order to find what you can do to build peace. It is not only weapons that are powerful, but also speeches and ideas. These are the tools available. Thank you very much.